As Christians, we have a lot of things in common. Paul talks to us in Ephesians chapter four, he, that passage we're very familiar with, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one spirit, one body, one hope, one Father. Things that we have in common, but not necessarily we share all at once. Uh, the baptism that I experienced, you experienced also, but we weren't all in the water at the same time. We have the same experience, but we don't all experience it at the same time. They're all real things that uh, we share as Christians, but we do it in a personal way. As I mentioned, my baptism I did by myself, yours you did by yourself. But worship, and that's what I want to talk about tonight, worship is that Christian event that is designed for people to experience together. It's different than the other things that I mentioned before. It is at the time of public worship that we see each other, and more importantly, it is at this time that we see each other do uniquely Christian things. We see each other and all at the same time we're taking the communion. We see each other and all at the same time we're offering prayer or songs or teaching and so on and so forth. Now, since this is a public group activity, it's no wonder that there tends to be a lot of discussion about how things ought to be done. Everybody's got an opinion. After all, public worship is about doing things as opposed to thinking about things. So people have opinions about how things should be done. And I'd like to review some of these ideas tonight, some of these things about worship with you in a lesson entitled Progressive Conservatives. And you'll figure out what progressive conservative means a little further down in the lesson. First of all, let's look at the things that most of us agree upon when it comes to worship. In reading the New Testament, we learn that in the context of public worship, and that's the difference between public and private worship, there is a difference in the New Testament. When the church gathers together, it is public worship. And during our public worship, there are four activities that constitute what we call worship according to the New Testament. The worship, the idea of worship, the word used for worship, in the Greek, one aspect of it means to kiss and to kiss forward, to send forward our love. Of course, not all activities that we do when we're together are worshipful in nature. Walking into the building, sitting down, smiling, we do those things, but the Bible doesn't see those things or call those things worship. Um, these are things that can be done reverently. I can walk in. Why do we say to the kids, stop running? Although it's an impossible task, we do say to them, stop running. We try to you know, uh, uh, instill in them a sense of respect when they come to, to worship. So even the ordinary things that we do when we talk and smile and walk and so on and so forth, we try to do them in such a way that recognizes that we are here gathered in a public way uh, for worship. You can go throughout the New Testament and you will see each one of these four elements elaborated and explained, examples of them being done properly or improperly, but it is always a combination of these that constitutes Christian worship. If we go in Acts chapter two, I love Acts, the book of Acts, and especially Acts chapter two, I have mined that passage, that chapter for so many things, so many ideas, so many important basic things. It's like Genesis, if you wish. So many important basic things are, can, are, are, are there in Acts chapter two. And if you look at verse 41 and 42, it says, so then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. So now we know who we're talking about. We're talking about the people who were added to the church they have been converted, and the very next thing they said, they were continually devoting themselves to, watch for it, the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayer. There they are, all four of them, one after another. So let's take them one at a time. 
they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. This was naturally the first element because it was Jesus' basic command to the apostles uh, regarding their care of the church. Matthew 28, 20, that they teach the church, they teach the believers, the converted, to obey all things that Jesus had commanded them. This teaching, of course, takes many forms. In 1 Timothy 4, uh, verse 13, Paul talks about exhortation and teaching and preaching and reading of scriptures. All of this is contained in the idea of teaching the saints. The basis is always the same, teaching to the church all of the teachings of our Lord and teaching us not only to obey, but how to obey the teachings of the Lord. So you know, if worship were a stew, something you were putting together, one element would be teaching. The second thing mentioned by Luke in Acts chapter two is fellowship. The Greek word here for fellowship means sharing, the common sharing of common things. In the context of the book of Acts, the New Testament shared the responsibility for caring for the needs of the saints. And we read about that a little further on in verses 44 and 45. They shared their time, they shared their homes, they shared their lives together. This, this sharing uh, in a public way um, uh, when we come together to worship is an important part of uh, uh, the public worship an important part of a Christian's life and offering to God. He mentions the communion, the breaking of bread. In Acts, uh, Luke mentions breaking of bread several times. Sometimes it means taking the communion, other times it simply means to eat. In Acts 20, verse seven, uh, uh, they talk about communion first, and then in verse 11, use the same word uh, to uh, convey the idea that they were eating. The context is what determines uh, what the word means. And so in Acts chapter two, since he refers to prayer and teaching, he means communion, not simply uh, eating a meal. Anyways, he talks a little further down about the Christians, how they were together and they ate together as well. So the taking of the bread and the fruit of the vine to commemorate Jesus' death, burial, resurrection is not only an act of worship, it's the central act of worship because it symbolizes the core and the foundation upon which our faith is based. The literal resurrection of our Lord from the dead is proof that He is God and guarantee that we also will raise from the dead. This particular act of worship is unique to Christianity. No other religion has anything quite like it and our participation in it is um, a continuous witness that we believe, it's a silent witness that we believe, uh, not only in the power of the cross, but we also believe in the resurrection and what ultimately that means for us, and that is our resurrection. And then there's prayer. The original Greek word for prayer was made up of several words. One word meant to motion towards or to move towards, and the other meant a will or a wish. Essentially, prayer is bringing our will and our wish before God in a variety of ways. If our desire is to praise Him and lift up His name in a glorious fashion, we can do as Paul instructs the church in Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, James talks about it in 5, 13, and that is songs of praise, spiritual songs. If we have needs or want to place before God the needs of the church, we can make supplications as Paul teaches in 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, 1 to 4, and then again in verse 8. If our need is for healing of the body or for healing of the soul, we bring each other before God through the prayers of the elders, chapter 5 of James, verses 14 and 15. So a variety of ways that this word uh, is used. Prayer is the means that we bring our hearts and desires towards God through supplication, through thanksgiving, through praise, through song. So these four elements, teaching, fellowship, communion, prayer, make up what we refer to as Christian worship. One clarification needs to be made here, however. We need to differentiate between, and here's my point tonight, we need to differentiate between public worship and private worship, formal worship and informal worship, because the Bible does. 
In Acts chapter 20, verse seven, Luke says that the church gathered together to break bread on the first day of the week. This is formal worship. Why? Because the entire church is gathered together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 and 18, Paul specifies that when the Corinthians came together as a church, they were to do certain things and have an orderly procedure to their worship. In other words, an orderly procedure to their teaching, to their fellowship, to the communion, and to the prayers and various types of prayers that were offered. Why? Because it's public worship. There can be five people or 50 people. There can be 500 or 50,000 people. There has to be order. There has to be some sort of way to unify a group of people to offer public worship in a way that's acceptable and orderly. That's why there are these instructions in the New Testament to guide us during our formal worship. So this has some practical applications for us as Christians. For example, in formal worship, when the church gathers together, the men are the ones who do the teaching. The women are not to lead or to teach. We know that, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34, 35, and 36. In informal times, in our homes, so on and so forth, there's the give and take and discussion regarding the Bible by both men and women. In Acts chapter eight, Priscilla and Aquila were teaching together. There was give and take there with someone who needed more instruction. In public worship, we put aside a certain amount of money for the work of the church. Someone says, hey, how come you didn't mention the collection you know, as that fifth act? Because the Bible doesn't mention it as a fifth act. That's part of fellowship. We share, we share all things. They shared their goods together, part of fellowship. If you want to make it a fifth thing, that's fine. I put it into, it's the way that we share. We share not only our love together, we share our resources in order to take care of the needs of others. And so the church has instructions for that part of their fellowship, the financial fellowship they have on the first day of the week, uh, that it's accountable to everyone. In private, well, in private, uh, we, there's no particular way. In private, I mean, we give money to many needs. We share our lives and goods. We help in, in a much less structured way. And we're answerable only to God in our conscience, not as in public worship where there is a way to do things and a time to do things and so on and so forth. In formal worship, we share the bread and the fruit of the vine as a witness of our faith, as a witness of our hope. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26. In informal times, we tell of what Jesus has done for us. We share our faith in that way. We do good in the name of Christ. We bring others to faith by sharing the gospel with them as we are able. This is our witness. I don't break out the, bread, you know, the, the, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine at my house if I want to make a silent witness to my neighbor who's come over to have a cup of coffee to make a witness for Christ. God has given us that that act, if you wish, that ritual, if you want to call it, as something that we do as a unit together, as a church, to make a public witness together corporately. But if I want to make a witness privately, I, I, don't, I don't have the communion in front of someone. I share the gospel. I give them this bread and talk to them about the blood of Christ, not the symbolic thing that I do on a Sunday. We have instructions for these things. In public worship, we use singing to praise God musically, and the men are the ones who lead in prayer and thanksgiving on behalf of the church, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. In our private lives, everyone can pray, everyone can praise God in whatever way they can, using their skills to God's glory. Everything we do should be a form of worship in our private lives, Romans chapter 12, verses one and two. You know, um, um, if you run, you can run to the Lord, to His glory. If you play the guitar at your house or wherever you are, you can play to God's glory. 
if you weld, if you make a birdhouse, if you, if you work with the, in a hospital, if you, whatever you do, you can do to the glory of God and should do to the glory of God. So most people agree that formal worship includes teaching, fellowship, communion, prayer, and that these activities should focus on Jesus Christ who is the object of our worship. In order to avoid confusion, we need to remember that the rules that guide formal worship, in other words, what we do when we come together specifically as a church, those rules are different than when we are alone or with only a few Christians that constitute the church. Formal worship is what happens when the church gathers together for that very purpose. That's what Paul is talking to the Corinthians about, the problems that they're having during their time of formal worship. But when Marty and Celestia and Judy and myself, when we're together in the name of the Lord, we're working, we're studying, we're working in the office, taking calls, visiting people, so on and so forth, the Lord is with us. He's told us whenever three or more, two or more are gathered uh, in my name, there I am in their midst, Matthew 18, 20. But he didn't say that his presence meant that we had to have formal worship. When Marty and I and Judy and Celestia are working in the office, even when we're working together on a particular thing, that's, that's not formal worship. We don't have to have communion and break out in a cappella song. And so most of us agree that there is a difference between the guidelines that direct formal and individual gatherings for worship. All right, so what we don't agree on, let's, let's get into that. One of the major things that divides Christians has to do with confusion over what belongs to public or formal worship and what needs to remain, needs to remain private. For example, there may be a woman, a sister in Christ, who is gifted as a teacher, as a speaker, and we have several of those in our congregation. But maybe there, there, there can be one of these individuals that feel that the level of their skill permits them to violate the Bible's teaching against women leading in public worship. See what I'm getting at? What is what is good when done privately can become an offense when done in the context of formal worship. We have to kind of know the difference here. You know, I have a good example of that, Dr. Harold Fletcher. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Dr. Harold Fletcher. I believe he's still alive. I haven't seen him in a long time, but he, uh, he's a music uh, teacher at Oklahoma Christian. And as a matter of fact, I believe he was on the original faculty back in 1950. He's the oldest living faculty member uh, at Oklahoma Christian. Uh, Dr. Fret, uh, Fletcher uh, is a gifted composer, I've written a lot of classical music, actually he's the one that wrote the uh, alma mater for Oklahoma Christian. Uh, he is also a musical historian, and what not a lot of people know is he is a gifted organist, playing classical music, a lot of the spiritual type of music written by the classics, and he plays this and he's given concerts and so on and so forth. But it never occurred to him to play the organ in public worship. Here is an individual whose main gift, who's the peak of his education and training and work brought him to a level of musicianship that very few people can reach. He could have said to himself, how can God, you know, not accept this gift, it's the, very, it's the very best thing I do. Why shouldn't I be able to offer it to God during worship? Well, there's a very good reason for that. Because God said, we don't use instruments in worship, we're to sing with the voice. And I don't believe, I've had Dr. Fletcher in class, I don't believe he ever struggled with that idea because he knew well the scriptures. He knew that individually in his home concerts, he could play you know, sacred music if you wish, he could play it. But it never occurred to him to try to cross that barrier and bring what he did in his private life, his private talent, into the area of public worship because the guidelines would not permit it. And so, as I say, what is good and what is perhaps to be 
uh, honored in private may not always uh, be uh, useful, may not always be permitted in public worship. Another thing that we seem to be disagreeing on more and more these days is how to do the things that we do during public worship. Some people have, uh, <coughs> excuse me, some people have grown used to you know, doing, remember I said we do things during public worship? <clears throat> Some people have grown used to doing the communion, doing the songs, doing the fellowship a certain way, and they're comfortable with it. Other, usually younger Christians, they want to do the same things, but they want to do them differently. Perhaps use more modern composers, more modern uh, you know, uh, church music. Perhaps shorten the teaching, lengthen the communion time. Perhaps have three song leaders instead of one song leader. You know, three rotating, I don't know, different things like that. The problem here is usually generational, not doctrinal. One generation likes the security and the comfort of the way things are, and sometimes they feel that the way that they do things is sacred in itself. They make the two songs and a prayer method into a divine doctrine and they become self-righteous if anybody wants to change that. Then the other group doesn't necessarily want to change what we do, in other words teach or pray or communion, fellowship, they just want to do it in a way that they can relate to in a better way because of their age, because of their background. Remember the largest population group in our nation are the boomers followed by the X generation. This younger group has been nurtured on television religion and internet and social media, charismatic movements, probably been involved in a lot of emotionalism and youth programs and camp and so on and so forth. They want to be able to identify with the worship. They want to feel something when they worship the almighty and awesome God that the songs talk about. That's why they want to clap their hands, that's why they want more rhythmic melodies, that's why there's greater use of audiovisual and group dynamic techniques. Now I believe both groups have a point and each have needs that have to be addressed. If we don't deal with the widening gap in the church, two things are going to happen. One, we will be dividing the church with each generation and each group going their own way. And I've seen churches that have done this. Right here in Oklahoma, we won't name names, but we know, you know what I'm talking about. Some churches, you know, the early service for the young people, and they do things one way, and then the late service for the older people, and they do things a different way. I don't agree with that, I'm just saying, that's what happens when that divide becomes so tenuous that eventually it breaks in, it breaks in two. It breaks in two. Or, we lose the opportunity to reach out to the largest segment of the unchurched population, those who are 18 to 40. It's a real problem. So when you look at a, a map of the United States, I love to use Oklahoma as an, as, a, as an example. When you look at a map of the United States and you see where Oklahoma is located, you will note that we're pretty much in the middle. I kind of like that idea. It, it, it appeals to my sense of order. We're right there in the middle of this country. Well, I believe that our position on this issue, you know, how to worship, should also be right in the middle. Neither conservative nor progressive, but rather, now you get it, progressive conservative. And that's where the title come from. Now someone says, where do you see progressive conservative in the Bible? Show me. Well, you won't see those two words together, but you see an example of it. I want you to go to Acts chapter 17, please. Acts chapter 17. Good example of this progressive conservative attitude was demonstrated by the Bereans in Acts chapter 17 verses 10 to 12 when Paul came to preach to them. And I'll only, reach a, only read a small section here beginning in verse 10. It says, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. Do you see the progressive conservative? 
They were progressive in that they listened to Paul and his seemingly new and radical ideas. Ideas that would mean important changes. They were not afraid. They were not reactionary. They did not, re they did not reject Paul outright and not even let him speak because, oh, you got a new thing. We don't even want to hear it. We like what we got. Get away from it. They listened. They listened because they had confidence in their knowledge of the scriptures. Luke says they received the word with eagerness. But on the other hand, they were also conservative. They were conservative in the sense that they were careful. They were prudent. They were wise. Verifying everything that was said against the proper criteria, and that is God's word, not hearsay, not passion that comes from debate, only God's word was the measuring, uh, the measuring stick for what Paul said to them. You know, we look back and say, it's Paul, it's the apostle, the great, but they didn't see Paul as the great apostle, the great, you know, he was in the middle of his ministry. He was the guy with the new idea. He was the guy that was causing trouble. He was the guy, didn't they beat this guy up? Didn't they put him in jail? Didn't they just run him out of the town? I would have loved to have been at that elders meeting. I would have loved to have been at that meeting there that they had. What, do, does he come or not? Someone would say, well, how much will it cost? Anyways. So they let him come. They let him come and they let him speak. And just because they let him speak didn't mean that they were accepting everything he said. They measured everything according to the word. So what I'm saying is we all need to become like the Bereans, progressive conservatives who are open and ready to learn and grow, but only learn and grow according to what is written in the book. Also, I think that we all would do well to remember two key ideas, regardless of what end. You, know, you may have identified with when I said progressive, you may have identified more when I said conservative. No matter what you identify with, a couple of ideas to help us keep the activities of worship in perspective, because it'll always be, there'll always be some tension here. Number one, try to remember that worship is not a human thing. What we do when we worship, the activities that we are involved in are expressions of our spiritual lives, not our physical lives. Yes, we use our physical bodies to sing and to stand and to sit and to speak and so on and so forth, but the exercise that we're doing is a spiritual one. So let's stop comparing our worship to human experiences in order to judge its effectiveness and its value. It's not like a business meeting. It's not like a concert. It's not like a rally. That's not what worship is meant to be. Unfortunately, the younger generation is looking for that feeling in worship, and plenty of groups are willing to give them that full feeling with all the bells and whistles. But those who do that in other groups, and some even in, in the church, forget that worship is not a human thing. It's a spiritual thing. It isn't entertainment. It's worship. We keep trying to make it feel like something earthly and it doesn't work. Public worship is an effort to communicate our love and our praise, our gratitude and our needs to a spirit being. It's not an experience like any other that we have and our only guarantee of success is obedience to the guidelines for this activity given to us by God, not how we feel. Remember, God is the one who invented worship, not man. You hear that perhaps some philosophers at some Ivy League schools who spin out the idea, well, man invented God and so you know, he invented worship in order to go with his invention of God, but we know that that's not true. God is the one that gave us worship. He's the one that put it within us. To do it right, we have to do it his way. So we've had a great worship if we've had a biblical worship. And then secondly, worship without love is vain. 
You can do the actions correctly, you can do them creatively, but if you don't love your brother in the process, your worship is useless. You know, Cain's offering was rejected because of his smoldering jealousy against his brother. Genesis chapter four. In Luke 18, nine to 14, Jesus tells us that the worship of the Pharisee was rejected because he despised the social status of the publican who prayed behind him. The Pharisee was there, oh God, am I ever glad I keep the command, I give my tithe, I do this, I go to the temple, so on and so forth, and am I ever glad I'm not like that guy back there, man, what a loser. I don't even know what he's doing here. And the publican back there, he was saying, God, I'm a sinner. I need you to forgive me. End of statement. You see, the Pharisee knew how to worship, but he didn't know how to love his brother. And because of that, his correct worship was vain. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, John says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. John reminds us of a basic principle which supports all that we do as Christians, including worship. Developing more creative ways to do the things of worship or maintaining the status quo may not violate the rules of corporate worship, but if the way that we implement our ideas or wishes violates the basic rule of love for others, it will invalidate our worship because worship without love is vain. You know, we've, we, we have to find a way to worship God in a manner that is both biblical and relevant for all, and the beginning for this is that there is love that exists among all the brethren. That's the beginning point. It's love in the church that produces the good feeling that we want, not styles of worship. One of the things that Bob Chilton does once a month is you know, he gets everybody to stand up and hug each other whether they like it or not. So the huggers are having a field day. Oh boy, I get to hug. And then you get, I won't mention his name, you know, Billy Van Curen, uh, <laughs> who stands like this, yeah, I like you too, okay, get away from me. <laughs> everybody gets a hug, you know, and everybody feels good about it. And you walk, you walk out, you know, and, and it was a wonderful worship. Did we sing different songs? We had the same worship leader, you know, the same preachers are up here. There was something about that day that was special. What was it? I don't know, I felt loved and I gave love to someone else. When there is love among the brethren, there is joy and enthusiasm. And this ignites our worship and it gives it meaning no matter how well we perform the actions. You get what I'm saying? I'm not denigrating at all the fact that we must and should have orderly worship in order to show proper reverence to God. And we have to follow carefully what he says in his word. The point I'm making is that this careful following of these actions without the accompanying love for one another invalidates our effort to make the right kind of actions during our worship. So as we close the teaching portion of our worship this evening, I want you to remember, first of all, worship is a spiritual thing that has different rules that guides public and private worship. And secondly, in order to have meaningful, satisfying worship, we have to begin by loving one another more, not just changing the order of worship. Finally, as, in our, as is our custom during our public worship here at Choctaw, we offer an opportunity for anyone to receive the ministry, the love, the fellowship of the church. Whether it's to hear your confession of faith and to be <coughs> baptized and to witness that, whether it's to pray for you if you have sinned, if you need restoration, whether it's to pray for your illness or whatever needs that you have, or perhaps to receive you into our fellowship 
uh, as you would place membership among us. It's always a time. Some people say, why do you have the invitation over and over again? Because every Sunday morning and night and Wednesday, someone different may have a need, and we want to make sure that we see to that need whenever we come together in a public way. So if you do have a need for ministry of some kind, we sing this song of encouragement so that you'll either come forward, bring a card forward, a prayer card, whatever it is. We encourage you to do that now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement. Bobby?